Good morning, folks, and welcome to The On Deck Show, a show that takes a look at people and organizations that are working every day to make things better for folks like you and I in their own way. This morning, we have the pleasure of speaking with Anne Ottenbright from that infamous 1984 Olympic team in LA. She's a triple Olympic medalist, including one gold, one bronze, one silver. She's been inducted into every possible Hall of Fame. She's been awarded the Order of Canada. She, to say she has had an incredible career would do it injustice. Today, she's the head coach of the Pickering Swim Club, and we're honored to have her here on the show this morning. Welcome, Anne. Hello, Jason. Hello, Jason. Good morning, and thank you for being here again. Thanks for having us. Yeah, so I, I kind of want to just dive right into it in terms of, uh, you know, talking about, you know, your swimming history, because, you know, being the age that I am and growing up um, swimming, you know, like that 1984 team, those those Olympics, like legends were born there and you were one of them. Um, and um, I want to talk a little bit about that talk about women in swimming, talk about women on that team, talk about your coaching career and kind of go from there. So um, if you're right, let's just get into it. Let's go. All right. So, in, um, you know, uh, starting the obvious place, I want to go back to the 84 Olympics, um, same night as, if, if I'm remembering correctly, same night as when Alex won the 400 AM, you were up shortly after that in the 200 breaststroke. Uh, you, you had just come back. Or you were you had recovered from an injury, um, first event up, first final up at the at the games, and um, in a really inspiring swim, you know, like you won a gold medal. Um, what do you remember? Well, you know, it's still incredibly clear. Um, the The moment in time I always talk about the moment in time when you you win win that medal and you. Uh, add everything together that you've been working for for a long time. Uh, leading into 84, um, there were obviously some issues that popped up. Uh, uh, my injury was one of them. Um, I dislocated my knee uh, beginning of May in uh, 84. But prior to that, I was... You, my biggest competitor at the time was Udiger Vanager, who was an East, East German woman. And well, <laughs> we had we had some major competitions over the years of always sort of one, two in the world. And um, so fortunately, I was looking forward to, you know, going to Olympics and winning my gold medal. That was the original plan and uh, being up against Udiger Vanager. And then when they decided to pull out, um, I believe it was around February that we found that out. Um, I guess my coach was aware of a, a change in my training. So brought me into, uh, 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 I, I don't know how it came to be, but he discussed it with Swim Canada and Swim Canada um, brought me over to East Germany. And I got to go through Checkpoint Charlie uh, into the east side, and that was quite the experience to swim against Uda at her home pool at European Championships. Um, and then being able to come back, I after beating her at home, I did come home and then refocused only just then to get my <laughs> dislocate my knee. So all of that, uh, I mean, between um, probably March till July, was I don't know if I'm swimming in my event or not. It was a real just, just to interrupt you there for a sec. So talk to me about because um, it, it really came down right to the wire because the, the Swimming Canada, your coach, it set up a time trial prior to the games to actually qualify for the games. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, they they put me on the mm -hmm. team. Uh, with the hope that uh, my knee, if it was uh, close to 100%, I would be able to uh, do the time that I had done prior to uh, Olympic trials. Um, I, I didn't do anything at Olympic trials, but prior to Olympic trials, the time I did in May before I dislocated my knee um, was based off of that. It was based off of could anybody beat the time that I did in May? So I didn't participate in an actual time trial. The other swimmers did. Oh, understood. Okay. Okay. Um, anyway, so, but but that swim going in, I mean, um, 
from and I, you know in my research for this i went back and just watched archive videos as much as i could find so on and so forth so the japanese girl and i can't recall her name at the moment like she was uh going into prelims like she was expected to be going in first but ended up you know uh, I think swimming out of lane seven or lane eight, five seconds off her best. And then you had this 15 year old Belgian girl who kind of came out of nowhere. Um, and in the end, it was a race between Canada and Japan. Um, and really at the end of it, just Canada, because, you know, like yeah. it was, it, it was quite a race. So um, talk to me a little bit about, you know, um, you, you, you mentioned your competition that was, um, they decided to boycott. She wasn't there. You had the Japanese, that was supposed to be up here who was down here you had the belgian girl who was came out of nowhere and was way up here what was that like um to sort of manage and navigate those emotions going into that race well yeah there was a lot of emotions first of all um my heat swim um was an experiment for me pretty much um getting up on the blocks that was the first time i was uh, able to do full full whip kick um, I didn't know really what kind of strength my leg would have through the whole um, 200. Um, I always had a stronger back end. So it was always um, that kind of confidence I had at the back end uh, to rely on. I didn't know if I would have that at this point. So everything was quite nerve wracking. The heat swim was nerve wracking. I didn't even, you know, the the my my start was even worse than normal. <laughs> I, was not, I don't have a good um, reaction time to anything. So that was that that was always my uh, biggest worry, uh, what I was going to be doing off of the block. Um, but of course, I was in the ready room while um, Alex won his 400 IM. The 400 IM, what, the TV was on in the ready room um, uh, in hearing your national anthem. <laughs> I, I, there was no, there was nothing that could pump me up more, obviously. Um, so getting up and doing that race uh, against Hiroko Nekasaki was the girl from Japan. We had swam together before. Um, and I was pretty confident that if I was able to do the race with the splits that I was able to do in the warm up, um, that I would, I would. I could possibly win if I did it the way, but the adjustment had to come of not being able to do the world record. I did realize that that was probably not within my reach. Although I was at the 150, I was still on <laughs> world record pace, but yeah, legs fail. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's still, it's it's quite a story to, um, you know, to go through the injury, recover, show up, and still be able to perform at that level. I mean, at the end of the day, when you look at, you know, what you were able to accomplish in that moment and how you were able to continue bettering yourself, like, that's pretty remarkable. Um, one of the things, like, going back and watching the archive videos, and, you know, I, I, I reached out to one of your former teammates, um, Tom Ponting, who, um, you know, is quite the historian on swimming. Um, anyways, just asking for some memories and stuff like that. And he shared some fond memories with about you and your friendship with Julie Daniel and so on and so forth. And um, anyway, so um, he pointed me in the direction of a couple of archive videos to go look at. And I have to say that although uh, that 200 breaststroke was the race that it was, and it was your first gold medal, I was like, I had greater goosebumps watching the 100 breaststroke. Simply because, <laughs> I mean, like you were, I, I don't know if the camera angle was true, but it looked like you were um, seventh or eighth going into the turn and you just like crushed everybody on the second 50. Like it was just, it was super awesome to watch. So what do you remember about that one? Well, <laughs> that's funny. It's so funny that, that you bring that up because it was actually quite, um, uh, an outstanding swim for me because I'm just not a, I'm not a 100 breaststroker. So it was coming back from the back end was really exciting. I was in lane seven and Tracy Calkins was in lane eight. Tracy Calkins sometimes said things okay. <laughs> that caused a little bit of motivation. So um, the, the, my main motivation was to not uh, be outtouched. By Tracy. 
and in the process, I ended up uh, in second place. I, I just had a, an incredible finish. That's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, like watching the race and um, watching that go. I mean, like it was just, um, it was, it was interesting. And I want to, I want, and whether or not this is, you know, like a secret move or not, you don't have to reveal if it was a tactic at the time. But listen to the commentary because at the time you still have the two false start rule, right? And you were the second false start. Um, and yeah. one of the, the suggestion from the commentator was that that was a tactic to make sure that everybody had to stay glued to the blocks going into that start. So was that intentional or was that just a commentator making a leap and a guess? Well, it's an, it's actually a really, really good idea. And I wish I had thought of that. Yes, but okay. no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know they did, they did, they said the same thing in the 200 because I, we kept false starting. The last thing, you know, back in the dark ages, those bathing suits were not flattering once you got them wet. So got the last thing we wanted to do <laughs> was to false start. I can tell you that. So, <laughs> right. It, they 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 had some issues uh, red suits i don't know but um anyway we we i never was a good starter um i my reaction time is just so delayed and and um i think the process to get from my head to my feet just took a long time so i never had a good start but yeah thank thankfully there were a uh, false start um uh, options there so that that, that I didn't get DQ. Just for the record, you could have totally claimed that as your tactic. Yes, yeah. I did that. I know. I would like to have. I really would have when they were saying it all the time. I was like, geez, that would have made me sound pretty smart, but no. <laughs> <laughs> the bathing suit situation won. On that. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. So, um, you know, talking about the team in general, like moving um, more to, I guess, like a macro view of that, that time. Um, you know, talk to me a little bit about your memories of that 84 team and specifically, you know, like the women on the team, because, you know, the four by one medley, um, was also a medal winner for you. Uh, you were also a medal winner with that team. Um, you know, what, what do you remember, um, being, you know, a female leader on the team and also, um, like just in general, the women on the team with you? Well, um, we were a really pretty close knit kind of group. I I feel like I felt like that team was um, really very cohesive. Um, we had so many leaders. There, I mean, that I wouldn't even classify myself as a leader of that team. the The, the whole team was. Um, we were so supportive of one another, and everybody was so. Um, like, uh, I don't know if, if you know, cl classifying women and, and the men on the team, I felt like we were just one big co cohesive group and there we were, we were riddled with leaders. So it was not, com there wasn't much conflict because of that. I felt like everything was about elevation and elevating each other's performance. We had an opportunity to do something, to make a statement um that canadian swimming it was competitive and we were able to 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 prove ourselves in that in that arena at that time because of our leadership well, that's a really interesting response so digging into that and unpacking that a little bit more so what what do you think was the groundswell for that um cohesiveness and you know you you talked about you know having many leaders and you know, many people kind of just you know like being, you know, the torchbearer, so to speak, um, for the team, like, what was it that brought that team together? What gave it that cohesion? I, I'm not, I'm, you know, I mean, as far as, uh, you know, my upbringing, uh, I was always coached for independence. So I feel that um, if you look at Alex and and Victor, I believe they were all coached for independence as well, not for dependence. I think we we're really fortunate having the, that kind of coaching background. So um, I I would attribute a lot of it to that and the fact that a, a lot of the athletes on that team came from that same sort of background. Um, but 
you know, that being said, I, you know, worked with university programs um, and every once in a while you get a team that just comes together and everything works. And if you could bottle it, you'd be, you'd be a very um, wealthy person. Hmm. Right? So it's just not something you can actually um, analyze to that level, I think. It's interesting. You dropped another, another nugget there that I always want to kind of unpack a little bit more. So when you're talking about it, coach for independence versus dependence, what did you mean by that? Um, I came from a small club program. They had to, uh, you know, 50 kids in the entire club. We all swam together. We swam um, as a, can, uh, you know, I'd have 10-year-olds swimming behind me. Uh, that that kind of leadership and what the expectation and elevation that I was put in to elevate my uh, teammates, I think is uh, really important. I think that's part of a, a great grassroots um, foundation and a program. Uh, as clubs get bigger, we kind of lose that kind of foundation. But uh, fortunately, a lot of us, we all came from that same kind of concept, right? Smaller programs where um, our impact then impacted the club for years to come after. It created a, um, a whole uh, series of events. Uh, but on top of that, I was, my, my coach, Paul Maronin, was not, you know, uh, on any of these national teams with me. Um, we would discuss how I would be swimming. I knew what I would need to be doing when I was on my own and, and getting myself from point A to point B. Um, I didn't need my coach for my success. We had instilled that through practice times and, you know, swimming endlessly like we do. Um, those were all instilled at home with my coach and with the confidence that he knew I could stand up and do that. I'm sure that's the same in a lot of the other swimmers experiences as well. There were a lot of small club kids in at, on that team. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's probably a reflection of Canada at that time in 84. I mean, I mean, you, you had, you know, university of Calgary, you had point Claire and like, there's some bigger clubs there, but you know, um, you know, it, it, it really was a very much a community driven sport. And speaking with, uh, you know, Pierre Lafontaine a few weeks ago, um, he, he referred back to that as, you know, potential strength for, you know, swimming in the future in terms of, you know, like really embracing the club program and making sure that, you know, like we're kind of like you're saying, you're creating these legacy effects from these influential swimmers or people that go through the club that then come back to inspire everybody else. And it creates, you know, um, almost a, a vacuum in a positive sense. Right. So, yeah. Um, so a uh, two part question here. So, um, and I'll, I'll lay them both out, but I'll lay them out individually as we come back to them as well. So talk to me about like what the sport of swimming meant to you. And then as a follow-up, um, you know, with your career, you, you accomplished a lot in a short period of time on the international scene. And I'm curious if you ever gave thought to um, potentially competing at the 88 games. Um, okay, so first question, what swimming meant to me was, uh, I mean, obviously, it was, uh, uh, I, I, I started watching the 76 Olympics, and I watched Nadia Comaneci. And when I saw Nadia, I decided this was something that I wanted to do, to go to Olympics and, and shoot for a gold medal. So, obviously... I was not going to be a gymnast. <laughs> so um, uh, I had to then uh, find something that suited me. I I did a lot of different things and ended up back in the water, which was a, a young love of mine in the backyard pool, learning how to swim at three. It, you could hardly ever get me out of the pool. So as soon as I jumped into the pool, um, it all happened very quickly for me. 
So getting in um, as a 12 year old, having to sort of uh, reorganize uh, uh, my plan of how I was going to get from uh, point A to point B, I, I created a five year plan and I started with the Canada Games, made that Canada Games team within that first year of uh, swimming with a, uh, an actual competitive club. And uh, after that, those Canada Games, it just sort of went really fast for me, obviously. Um, carried on from that experience. Um, and it sort of um, solidified the idea that going to Olympics and winning a gold medal was something that I could do. So um, I love swimming, obviously. I'm still on the deck. It still has pulled us back in. We try to leave, we come back, and, you know, I've been coaching for a very long time. Um, as far as the 88, it was sort of a weird, um, you know, we go through a lot of transitions. I was at school at uh, USC following uh my 84 swim. I swam two years uh, at USC and then I came home and finished schooling up at uh, Wilfrid Laurier University. Um, it was just not ever something that entered my mind anymore. And I, I sort of attribute a lot of it into the fact that we were amateurs, you know, so we didn't have any sort of financial uh options we you know you you're you're carded but you couldn't have sponsorship you couldn't you know to me it was about getting schooling and then moving on to that next level it had never been about this is going to could possibly be a lifestyle mm. option for me and so i my goal was to win that gold medal once i did that then it was i was i was done not to say that I couldn't have, you know, refocused had I um, maybe thought about it a little bit more. But at the time, it just, I, it was just a, a move on for me. That's interesting. And just going back to something you mentioned in the the first response to the first question, you talked about you taking the initiative to create a five year plan, which ultimately crescendoed at the Olympics, and it did. So, I mean, one that's pretty rare to actually create a plan that, you know, like you follow, I mean, part, I don't think you planned the injury, but, uh, <laughs> but that wasn't you know, in the plan, <laughs> but like you, you, you plan it out, you lay it out and it actually comes to fruition. Like that's rare, right? Like it actually happens on the first try like that. So, um, you know, having that kind of vision and being able to say, you know, like, this is what I want. I'm going to go achieve it. Um, how much of that behavior is kind of like repeated itself after swimming like you went to school and then you jumped into coaching and all that stuff there but i mean how much of that is carried on or how much how many times has that repeated itself i guess in your life well and that's funny that you should say that because i you know i i really focus a lot on pattern behavior and as a coach i think it's really important to recognize pattern behavior and in, in your athletes or in anything right in any day to day um, recognitions is keeps everybody self-aware and makes you accountable and uh, aware of what's happening in my plan I did that on my own and and um, you know my coach and I would do a seasonal plan but I always had sort of a, a and and I, I laugh about it now because at the time we did not have any access to internet <laughs> we were lucky to have a color tv hmm. um uh, but uh we would wait for the swim magazine uh and there was always an insert that would come in there that would show uh international um rankings and in the swim magazine uh nick theory always had the rankings right the rankings were very important um a, a very big motivator i think it was awesome for people to see that and people can go on and and access that information now quite easily um at that time it was difficult for me to sort of guesstimate what would uta's time be next year at world championships or uh 
you know, what would my time, what can I expect? I need to be at um, Como Games and, and that kind of thing. So we, we wouldn't have access to that, the, the final results of, of swim meets. You wouldn't be able to just pull that up and find out what would, what in and around the time would you need to be doing? So it was an interesting task for somebody as young as I was that I was that interested in it. Um, you know, if I, w I wish I had been that interested in doing schoolwork as I was <laughs> accessing <laughs> swim times. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it, it, as part of that process of breaking down, um, I went backwards. I went from five years out and went and then went to present day. So uh, it was an interesting way of doing it. Uh, I like my athletes to do that now when we do it. Uh, but at the time, I did not. My 84 plan really did not follow any plan. <laughs> I had to learn how to become a good um, arms only breaststroke. I never did breaststroke pull on a regular basis. So knowing my times in practice doing um, uh, breaststroke pull was so foreign and meant nothing to me. It was a very frustrating time doing that training camp. And I was fortunate to have some amazing lane buddies that helped me through that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I just want to point out, I mean, like being able to take, have the perspective to, to look at a plan and be able to plan it retrospectively, you know, like, where's my goal? And at that age, so I mean, you were, you were, I guess, 18 at the 80, 84 Olympics. So you're talking about doing this when you're 13 years old, if you're yeah. talking about a five-year plan, right? So the self-awareness of a 13 year old. And this, the self-awareness piece seems to be a very common trait in a lot of people that we speak to um, in terms of, you know, what led them to, you know, memorable or successful moments in their life. And it always, it often, I won't say it always, it often comes down to the ability to be self-aware and recognize and have a moment of clarity. This is what I want and this is how I want to do it and so on and so forth. So that bridges us to, you know, like where I want to go to next, which is kind of into your coaching, because you said you have been coaching for quite some time. Tell me a little bit about where you started, why you got into coaching, and then I want to talk a little bit more about your philosophy. Okay, well, I started when I went to uh, Wilfrid Laurier University. I started uh, coaching just uh, like a novice level while I was going to school to make some money to put myself through school. And then um, at the end, I uh, took over the uh, Wilfrid Laurier University team. And that sort of catapulted me into uh, University of Guelph and, and, uh, and then numerous places. Obviously, I went to the States. I coached at uh, University of Wisconsin in Eau Claire and um, then came back home and I've been with Pickering ever since. So it's been a it's been like a 30 years I've been coaching uh, about maybe more. But yeah, yeah, that's, that's fair, fair enough. And um, so your your the longest stewardship is with has been with Pickering and Pickering has been how long? I have been there. Okay, uh, I have to go by the ages of my children to figure those things out. Okay, uh, tw twenty years, twenty or nineteen years with Pickering. Wow, wow. Yeah. I'm sure you've seen a lot, and um, you know, like there's been a lot that's happened there as well. So. Um, in terms of the philosophy of the Pickering Swim Club, I'm sure that largely represents your philosophy. So what is that? How does, what is the Pickering Swim Club? Um, I believe in the sense of community. So, I, you know, we have uh, numerous levels of, of athletes and I believe the best experience for everybody is to understand a sense of community. That's been hard during COVID, obviously, um, and how we've tried to do that. I think we've done a nice, a pretty good job. Uh, but getting back and being able to experience 
volunteerism and and and, and, and in, including everybody into everything that we do. We run a lot of swim meets, so um, it's really important for us to have a volunteer base club. Um, and in that, I believe you you create a, a great sense of community. I personally believe that athletes should be self-aware and come through a program um, and independently be able to maintain their own motivation. Um, and that being said, because of their uh, sense of ownership for their success. So I don't want to, I don't believe in creating an environment where uh, the coaches have to create um, a motivating environment for the athletes. I believe we create a motivated group together. We excel together. We elevate together. Okay. So I want to unpack that a little bit. So like these are, these are very high level statements. So in terms of how do we actually do that? So how do you elevate together? Cause you, you know, for anybody that's been involved in swimming, um, like you have a club and you might have, um, you can have quite a variety. You might have a six-year-old that's coming in that doesn't know how to swim, a six-year-old that's a great swimmer. You might have a 15-year-old on the national team, a 15-year-old that just wants to get fit for life-saving. So how do you uh, bring that all those people together in a cohesive way? Okay, so uh, I believe in creating intrinsic motivators uh, at a young age. So as they come in and we begin a, a developmental a program approach. Um, we we do have a learn to swim, but uh, that's separate from our our programming, um, including in this. Um, at, once they come in, I believe it's really important to uh, teach them how to uh, motivate themselves through achieving goals and goal sets and things like that, and um, elevating themselves to understand why they are here and what is their uh, long-term plan because you know you can create a, a, a an extrinsically motivated athletes very easily they can be extrinsically motivated by getting you know i want to get the um swimmer of the week award and i want to you know but as a 12 year old as younger than 12 and moving into 12 they start there needs to be a shift and that shift needs to create a um, an athlete that is intrinsically motivated. You know, I, I don't want to ever see parents carrying their swim bags. I don't want the parents packing their swim bags. I, I don't want um, kids to have their, their goal, their times um, or their events or anything like that written on their hands. They should know what their goal time is. They should know what they want to achieve. Um, because if they just read it off of their hand and they're about to dive in and do a 50 free and it's event number three and, and they dive in and have to look at their hand to prepare, it's just not a, that's not a prepare, right? So they're not aware. They're not aware. They are diving in and, and, and the other, uh, the other belief in that, I believe so much more in, in the kid's ability to remember those three events in in one session, I believe they can all remember those three events. I believe they can. And parents need to take that same approach and believe they can as well. Um, and so we go through that from beginning to where do people branch off? Um, the best group for them is the one that they are elevating themselves in. So everybody can move throughout the club um, as they achieve those different levels and those different levels of commitment and intrinsic motivators as they achieve those they move on through through the programming so every group is actually suited for those athletes some people would disagree with us but <laughs> they are yeah. <laughs> right like you know the my goal is to keep them in the water as 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 long as we can and keep them happy and motivated as long as they can maintain that for themselves and then you know if they can uh see themselves moving on to the higher level uh and 
elevating themselves to that, they have that opportunity. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that uh, I guess, you know, shifting away from uh, this for a moment, and um, one of the things that, you know, like I've been immersing myself quite a bit in, in terms of, you know, what do we do with our business? And, you know, like, how are we adapting and stuff like that? And this is, this last year has been a, like, has been a real opportunity for self growth, if you look at it the right way. Um, And I've, you know, been fortunate enough to be able to have the ability to do that, to step back and say, okay, well, what do we actually want to do? Why do we exist? And, you know, how do we really define these things and whatnot? And one of the recently, you know, one of the areas where I've really been um, uh, paying a lot of attention to is, is my, my habit of remaining in an infinite mindset versus dropping into a finite mindset. So a finite mindset, a mindset with, with, rules and limitations and this is what i have to do and this is the structure versus an infinite mindset where um we're looking at well what is the ultimate goal and how do i work to be better at achieving that every single day you know how do i get a little bit better and move a little bit closer to that every day so would that be a good summary of what you're talking about yes i believe it's really important to have three things that you can do better in a day like if if I'm dealing with my athletes, that's how we want to approach it. This this past year has, has been very difficult when it comes to rules and regulations, right? Like there's so many things that we have to be able to follow and make sure that we're following all of those, those things. So a, a little bit of creativity is obviously lost in that process. But I think, um, you know, ha- having athletes and or anybody in any aspect of their life be able to see see three things that they could do better um and whether it's uh, you know can i can i focus on my attendance can i focus on once i'm here at at that practice then that was a goal achieved what am i now going to what are those three things you know am i always the last person in the pool Today, I'm not going to be the last person in the pool. I'm going to make sure I don't miss any of the warm-up. Things like that. Like, they they are all achievable options, right? But in each process, you are making yourself better. And you're becoming a little bit more aware of your patterns, right? So if you, 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 you get triggered by some sort of um, experience and it causes you to pull back and be cautious, um or you're working a certain energy system and you find that you can't push through that energy system and work a certain way, then how are you going to deal with making that still something that you can improve yourself on, right? So, okay, I'm not going to be able to stay and make that pace. So now I'm going to focus on my turns and my underwater work, something like that, right? Like what do we need to do? But the more athletes become aware and and where of their weaknesses then you can make those steps to make an improvement yeah fair enough and definitely um a lot of repeatable um or uh, several things that you've come back to is they they clearly you know they seem to be core values you know repeatable behaviors constant improvement planning um so with that said i'm curious um as as a head coach do you have goals for the swim club and what might they be if you do? Um, well, I, I, I always, yes, I always have plans for what we want to see our athletes um, elevate themselves to. Um, and I always want to have a financial support within the program um, to do that. Um, and we always want to repay um excellence, whether it's coming in as, as a, even a volunteer within our, our officiating options, you know, we want to try to always be feeding that success with, um, recognition. Um, but that being said, this year has been a little, very trying and, you know, we've had to really step back on just goals of what is it going to take to be able to be in the water? Mm. Um, and, you know, um, I don't know that this season is going to, we're going to be able to get back in the water at all this season. So that being said, then what? The next thing is, okay, can we start doing summer camps? What can we do? 
I know that we're going to be looking at a big hole because we have not been able to do any um, of our learn to swim. So that is going to show up in about three years. That hole is going to show up. So we're going to have to, what I'm uh, right now, I'm planning on how are we going to deal with that potential hole and how do we try to fill it up before it becomes an issue? Things like that. I mean, we're just always, you just always have to be kind of thinking about the future. You know, we don't, we don't think one year at a time. We're always thinking three to four years ahead. Clearly a habit from the time you were 13 years old. So yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, no, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, like you shared a ton of information. So, I mean, um, I, I think this is a pretty good place to wrap this up, but before we do, I'm wondering for the people that are listening, whether it's old teammates or swimmers or coaches or whatever the case is, do you have any final words that you'd like to leave with everybody? And, you know, like you, you've talked about this, the experience with COVID and dealing with the trying ups and downs of the last you know, 15, 16 months, um, and, you know, plans to move forward and stuff like that. But, you know, all that to say, do you have any final words you'd like to leave with everybody? Um, okay. Probably, I mean, um, in 84, for example, is a great example of some amazing team, um, camaraderie and, and team support and everything that happened through that, that, uh, training camp can, it, uh, those training camps always feel like they were so much longer than they actually were. Right. Like, you know, not in a bad way either. Like it's, it's not like, Oh my God, it was such a long training camp and so much hard work. It was the, the lead in of, of that experience was incredible. And the camaraderie and the elevation that everybody had at that time, I was, like I said, I had a lane buddy. Um, and he was a breaststroker and he uh, elevated me through that trying time. It was really hard. Tr like swimming through an injury is a very difficult thing. Um, a lot of athletes have to, to de deal with that kind of thing on a regular basis. I was fortunate that I only experienced that one time of, of like a career ending kind of uh, situation. Um, and in that end uh, end product, in '84, we the Canadian swim team had this amazing uh, tradition of throwing frisbees into the stands when you win a medal. Yeah, yeah. And I was not good at that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I knocked someone unconscious in that first frisbee <laughs> threw out there. Um, but because those those were incredible stands in '84, those, those stands went up really really high, and the frisbee went up really really high, and then came a uh, pile driving somebody right in the back of the head, and up oh. came back down pretty fast. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, it, there's this moment where you go into um, back into the ready room, get your clothes back on, and meet with the press and whatever. So I had to go into this room and I'm thinking, who is going to be, who have they sent to give me my Frisbees? Who is going to be the person in there? Cause at this point I still haven't like gone crazy. You know, I wanted to scream and shake somebody and be really excited. And I hadn't seen anybody yet. And so I'm going to try not to cry because this happens every time I tell a story. I get in there and I'm thinking, is it going to be Julie? It's probably going to be Julie. Is it going to be one of the coaches? I don't know. It's going to be somebody. And it turns around and it's Marco. And, oh. and he had a tear in his eye. And at that point, I realized we were all in this together. Everybody brought me to that moment. Sorry. No, that's like beautiful. Like I said, goosebumps <laughs> listening that, to you right now. That, that is to me the most important thing that being part of a team is, is that everybody has a task and everybody, everybody brings everybody to that level. That's fantastic. That's a great piece of wisdom to leave this on. And I'm sure it sounds like you've built a fantastic community in Pickering. Um, oh, very thank you very fortunate to have you there and 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 impart that knowledge and wisdom because at the end of the day you know um 
much like what you've talked about, you know, common theme is that, you know, like this is a journey. It's not like, you know, um, we're, we're looking to punch a ticket to, you know, a destination that's an hour away. It's like, this is, this is a lifetime worth of work and experience. That's all, um, leads somewhere as, you know, an example of, of your story, you know, you, when you were 12 years old, you started swimming, you got into swimming and, you know, after a 30 year coaching career, you're still involved in swimming. It really is a journey. Um, and, you know, I hope that, you know, those that are under your tutelage, you know, get the, um, you know, the fantastic experience to experience the same thing or a similar, uh, similar experience. Yes, I hope so too. <laughs> well, and I really, like, I'm, I'm honored that you, you agreed to do this and you chose to spend some time with us this morning. I really appreciate it and I uh, can't wait to get this episode out. And I really thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. I enjoyed it very much. And good luck to Pickering and everybody at the Pickering Swim Club. And stay safe, everybody. Thanks, Anne. Thanks for tuning in. If you like the content that we've been creating, make sure you check it out here.